Um, my name is Jane Eliasoff. I'm the director of the Mockler History Center. And um, I am thrilled to invite you and welcome you all here tonight because this is really a good one. I feel like I say that all the time, but I think this one really is a good one. Um, Ira has been doing a lot of research on it and even did some more research this afternoon. So you benefit from what he's learned this afternoon as well. Uh, the Montclair History Center has been doing these since April 3rd was the first one we did. And in the beginning, we did it every single week. And then we sort of went down to this more um, livable schedule of every other week. And I believe everybody's been enjoying it as much as I have because I've been getting some really sweet, sweet comments about it. I would like to thank you um, for all your support with these programs, both verbal and financial. And they've just been... Um, really a lifeline for us in the midst of this whole crazy year. If you would like to donate some money to the Montclair History Center, we would love it, of course, and you can do it on our website at um, www.montclairhistory.org. You can do it by sending us a check to 108 Orange Road, Montclair, New Jersey, 07042. We accept Venmo and we accept Zelle. So either of the two, uh, either of those four options are great. Um, we'll get them. So um, thank you for everything, for being part of this program during this year. And yes, we've gotten a lot of questions. Will you continue this once things open up? And I think we will. We're kind of investigating how to do it as a hybrid model as we move forward. So you'd be able to come um, or you'd be able to watch it online. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Ira Smith, who's our presenter tonight. Um, Ira is the co-founder of Smith Marin Architecture and Interiors, which is a Montclair-based uh, design firm. It's been around since 1997. His firm serves a wide variety of clients, including corporate, uh, commercial, institutional, and residential clients. And he's particularly interested in the opportunities that are presented with some of um, the historic structures in Montclair. Um, and adaptive reuse. To that end, he has served on the Montclair Historic Preservation Commission for 10 years, um, had served, I probably should put that in the right tense, and he served for four years as a vice chair and also for four years as a chair. His credentials are impeccable and his program was fascinating. So with that, I'm not even gonna mention the guy's name, I'm turning it over to you, Ira. All right, thank you very much, Jane. And uh, I wanna thank you and Helen uh, for what you do at the History Center and the entire staff there for supporting this presentation series. Uh, and obviously all of the MHC supporters out there, including everyone joining us today. And even if you're just a history-minded person, thank you. Um, it, it is April Fool's Day, uh, but what you're about to see is, is no April Fool's joke. It's a repository of images that has, uh, uh, gives us a fascinating visual record, particular to Montclair, that few people know about. Um, it's a resource that ties together many of my own interests, uh, some of which Jane mentioned, drawing, architectural history, town planning. Um, but I think as you'll see, it has importance in ways, this collection has importance in ways that go beyond the borders of Montclair. Um, I'll start my images in a minute, but I wanna explain how I first encountered this collection of images. Uh, it was around 2005. I was still on the Historic Preservation Commission and someone in the planning department suggested I might be interested in this wooden box that had been collecting dust on a shelf. It was long and narrow. Um, I opened it up, inside were about well, exactly 37 glass slides, color slides, positives, uh, meaning not a negative, but you could see what was on the image. Each was about four inches by five, sitting in its own little uh, carved wooden slot. No one seemed to know what the slides were for, which seemed strange because it was obviously uh, packaged in a very careful way. And that communicated to me that the contents were of or once had some importance. Fortunately, there was one piece of paper inside the box. And now I'm gonna share my screen and we'll start the visuals on the presentation. Okay, this was the piece of paper, uh, pad size, with a lot of information which seemed not believable and not clear, Teague report, 
Well, these were visuals. There was no written report. 1946. I'd never heard of it, even though by that time I'd, I'd spent, you know, about five solid years on the Historic Preservation Commission, learning everything I thought I could and about all the resources in town. Uh, unified Storefronts, Bloomfield Avenue. What a strange thing, I thought. Source, January 4, 1965, PB Minutes. Planning board minutes. I knew from my time working with the municipality that PB meant planning board. So I thought, oh, this must have been some town initiative or something like that. Maybe one day I'll find out more. Uh, well, I have in the years since. Uh, I've learned a lot about this mystery box and I followed the historic breadcrumbs and started to put together the story of how and why these images came to be. In fact, this is the, well, Earlier today was the first time I publicly shared my research. Unfortunately for you all, this is now the second time. Uh, but I'm confident, just in general, there's a lot more to learn about this time capsule. This, in many ways, is the tip of an iceberg. So we're going to start here with a typical slide from the collection, uh, the corner of Valley and Bloomfield, looking north. Uh, so there are many ways to talk about the images in this collection. And even in this single slide, there are many ways we could talk about its content. We could discuss it purely as a piece of art. Uh, it's, it's a collage, frankly, this photograph on the bottom, artwork above, which is based on the photograph. Uh, we could talk about it as a polemical device, which I'll get into later. These slides were intended to persuade the public that a transformation of Bloomfield Avenue was a great idea. Uh, we could talk about the privatization of public property. You'll notice in this image that while below we see what at the time was the fire and police headquarters, it's been transformed in this image into a department store. And you'll notice uh, Valley north of Bloomfield was wider at one point with some ambiguity about where the private structure on the left, which I've read that there was an ice cream store here, but I also see gas pumps. But in any case, it's kind of been colonized here with a second story structure, office space overhanging the gas stations. Not quite clear if this is a, a roadway for the public or it's double lanes for the gas station. I'm spending a few extra seconds on that because this is gonna become relevant later. Well, I could go on, but for the purposes of the time we have together now, I'm gonna try and keep things simple uh, and provide an overview rather than a deep dive into any particular area. So I've organized the presentation into three parts. Um, with the possibility of expanding one or more parts in the future, depending on your response. And we had some interesting questions and comments earlier today. So the three parts for this evening are, what do the slides show? Uh, I'll talk about the specific content of the images, what they're showing us um, and trying to communicate. Number two, who made these slides and why? I'll talk about the people and movements behind the creation of the slides and their agenda. And three, what is the relevance of the slides today? I'll talk there about what we can learn from the slides in terms of today's events, actually how the slides are used and they are in fact still used and how they reflect conversations we're still having about the future character and development of the town center. I think even in this abbreviated fashion, you'll find this is a, is a big story. It touches on themes of national self-image, high artistic aspiration and professional tragedy. So what are the Teague slides? It's a collection of images, as I said, from 1948, depicting Bloomfield Avenue, both as it existed at that time and as it might look if it were made over almost in its entirety in a modern style. And this is a block by block inventory and re-envisioning from the 100 block in the east, which is pine and maple to the 700 block in the West, which is where St. Luke's Place meets Bloomfield Avenue. As I've mentioned, each image is a composite, the lower half consisting of a cropped photograph of the actual streetscape at the time. And the top half of the slide is the same streetscape, but with a variety of architectural transformations. And um, you'll, you'll see a little later in my presentation, a few images are exceptions to what I've just described, uh, but the, the bulk of them, the great majority of them look just like this. Um, so this is the 500 block, which is the stretch of Bloomfield Avenue facing the Hink building in the town center. The Claridge movie theater uh, is, in that, is in the Hink building as another point of orientation for everyone. Um, some things I can point out here, which are standard, kind of standard architectural treatment that you'll find, uh, it's almost the least interesting thing about the set of images is that uh, almost 
every block sees a uniformity or regularization of the cornice line. We can see how the cornices sort of jump up and down almost with out regard to the number of stories in the structure, like two story structures here, they each have different heights, three story structures here and here have different heights, but all of that's cleaned up, homogenized. Um, there's an emphasis on the storefronts all of them are made over, but they do differ one from another. Sometimes the entrances are recessed. Sometimes you have banked glass, um, angled in plan in other words, and a lot of attention paid to signage, not so much in this image, but signage for the stores plays an important role uh, in what you'll be seeing. Um, let me move on and we'll come back to some of these themes. I wanted to talk about uh, another sort of standard condition within the set of slides, which is that it's not true that every building is transformed. There are select buildings, certain historic structures that are left untouched. The Lackawanna waiting station, uh, the terminal waiting station is untouched. Um, I don't think that was necessarily because of uh, an interest in historic preservation. I think there seems to be maybe kind of a, an appreciation for the difference between public property and private. and um, I think we can ascribe the, the protection, if you will, more to something as practical as that. But a building like Station Square, right in the, in the middle here, um, which has uh, a lot of different sort of things happening, um, is completely transformed. You've got the level cornice line. Uh, you can forget about the turret and these bays of structure are no longer expressed. They're all behind a curtain wall. Again, we're talking about 1948 and the curtain wall was really in its earliest stages of development here in the country. Uh, there is, however, very practical uh, design decision made, which is that mostly, not so much this curtain wall and, uh, and a few other places, but uh, the structural bays of buildings are respected so that we see a gabled form, a narrower bay here and a gabled form. You can see here, we have that uh, above, we call that wider bay an A, oops, an A wider bay by, followed by a B narrow bay and A wider bay. So there's a, there is a practical and architectural mind at work developing these drawings. You can see that as well in this structure on the left. That becomes important as we tried to figure out who made these drawings and who were they. Another uh, slide here, we are looking at the south side of Bloomfield Avenue. This is Church Street on your right and uh, South, South Fullerton here. I'm actually in this building, right behind this window right now. That's where our offices are located. Um, Church Street did see some makeover in the proposed designs here. And for those of you who know Church Street, you, do, you may have recognized that some of the storefronts there have Art Deco or streamlined leanings. And I think it's very likely that that work was a result of this presentation. Unlike Bloomfield Avenue, where most of what was proposed was not executed. Um, one piece of evidence for the like disinterest in history is the makeover of the Crane Building, one of the founding families. This building was actually much shorter at first and it was enlarged over time, completely obscured by the new look, uh, so much so that it just starts to kind of, in a homogenous way, resemble the building next to it which again obscures uh, the sort of rhythm of these three distinct buildings just becoming one larger building. But again, a lot of attention paid to storefronts and structure. Some buildings were just fine the way they were and they weren't traditional. They were already in vogue, let's say. So here we are further west, you're looking at what's now Whole Foods. Uh, you can see the food fair is what it was called. And um, I'll be zooming into other slides. So just for the sake of time, I'm not gonna bother doing that now, but um, it pretty much stays exactly the way it was. Uh, there's infill between the PSE and G building and the food fair called Supermart, sort of envisioning a day when supermarkets would grow. And that's in fact what happened. I, I didn't point out to you in the very first slide that it had a, a market, a food market uh, in that block facing the Hink building. And that was quite common. Maybe every second or third block would have a little grocer um, very different way of, of shopping and, and buying your, your, your food goods uh, in the 1940s. And the same was true for the Hampton House. The Hampton House had been a puzzle to me um, until I discovered these slides. I was unsure of its vintage. It appears in these slides already completed. 
And uh, subsequent research shows it was actually designed in 1947 or completed in 1947. And it's a point of reference, uh, as you'll hear later, for the people who gathered to work on this makeover vision for Bloomfield Avenue. But you can see um, the Chase Building left intact. It's a bank building, which is notable. Another bank building, uh, another Montclair branded bank also left intact, um, which is kind of curious and interesting to me. Um, as I said, I'll, I'm gonna come back to speculate a little bit about why these classical buildings were given a more reverential treatment. Uh, I can't help but sneak in this image. I think I once told Jane, this is like the building I'd most like to have dinner with. Um, it's gone now, it was replaced by the Chase Bank, which was itself built in stages. You wouldn't know it uh, between the image on top, which is around 1900 and the image below 1948. Uh, there were other buildings here and they were consolidated one at a time. And then the Chase Building kind of grew uh, and, and consumed all three of them. But this uh, also shows us the Doremus Building, which was another uh, important family. And this is sort of a whole goods kind of store, general store for the community. It's still under this facade, it lurks under there. And uh, those of you who are local know the building is undergoing major renovations right now. The west face here, uh, some of the metal panels have been removed and you can still see the brickwork uh, that used to be there. But I included the slide really because I wanted to emphasize, like most places, our town center has always been evolving. There have been many campaigns of construction clustered around 1880, um, 1920s, and then again around the 40s. And um, we sometimes think about the, uh, the, the town we inherit as how it's always been. And in truth, it's always been evolving. And instead of looking at this group of slides as outrageous or audacious, I think we should just recognize it as just another moment in time, people asking themselves, what kind of community should we live in? So I did a little bit of research. Uh, and was not getting really far. Um, recently, I discovered this article dated November of 1948. The slides were introduced to the public in the form of large format posters. And that was in July, several months before November, but here we are in the Montclair Times months later, and these images are still a subject of interest in this public announcement. But I included this slide because I wanted to show you uh, sort of in the, uh, the currents of the time. And that very much included a conversation about modernity and aesthetics as uh, they would appear in all sorts of things from small products to vehicles, to buildings, to cities. So we can see in the bottom right, this image of a fairly streamlined vehicle. And I wanna to read to you a passage from uh, a book written by a professor at NGIT, Darius Solahub, called Millennials in Architecture, which looks at generational changes and how uh, different groups of people, particularly designers, have, have been looked at and how they've looked at the world. He has this perspective, which I think is interesting. It illuminates or begins to answer the question, well, this was such a comprehensive vision. Why didn't it happen? Why wasn't more of it executed? So he writes, the only significant aspect of streamlining to linger was the styling of American automobiles. Having adopted the aerodynamics of military aircraft, vehicles with prominent but useless tail fins celebrated a daily victory parade on new American highways well into the 1960s. I agree with Darius's emphasis on aviation and the military. This is just three years after the end of World War II. America has saved the world. It was done through military might. There was a lot of pride in that. There were technological advances, particularly aerial. And that was exciting and America owned that. And when the GIs came home, um, looking at the cities they lived in, I think a lot of them, designers in particular, were asking themselves, well, do we really wanna be part of the old world or part of the new world that we seem to have brought into existence? Um, there's more to say about that architecturally because architectural advances, progressive architecture really was born in Europe in the 1920s and 30s. And I'll come back to the relevance of that in a few minutes. So uh, in the back of my mind, uh, until I thought I could prove it, um, I even questioned whether Teague, who some of you might be a name you know, was even part of this effort. Uh, 
because the images look like things he might have been associated with. But who was Teague? What I knew about Teague, Walter Dorwin Teague, was that he was regarded as the Dean of Industrial Design. He started his life as an illustrator, moved into advertising, was very interested in signage, very interested in typography, uh, eventually got into product design, and that migrated into storefront design. His big hit was being hired by Kodak to redesign the Brownie camera. And that camera was featured in the 1934 Museum of Modern Art uh, exhibition on uh, introducing modernism to America. Um, from there, he ended up getting contracts with some of the largest businesses and corporations of the time. Uh, Dove, I think it was one, and Ford, Texaco, uh, really, truly countless. And I'll mention a few more as we continue. Um, but was he involved? This is an example of his earlier product design. Um, sure, the, the form of this resembles some of the form making we see in the drawings, uh, or rather the photographs that I've shown you. Uh, well, in this building too, this is 1939. This is Walter Dorman Teague's contribution to the 1939 World's Fair, a huge event and launched several decades of popular World's Fairs. But um, this, image as you can see is not so different from some of the design choices made in the makeover Bloomfield Avenue with large bands of glass, commitment to like large blank surfaces, maybe a large gesture with some curve in it. And this is a telling image. This is a model of that building where we can see this, the photograph uh, was kind of sort of standing in front of the main piece here. But in fact, the building was enormous and extended in back with a circular form. Um, and Teague, who actually wrote articles about this, discussed uh, not just product design as um, something that was good for the bottom line, although he definitely believed that, but he was also attentive to the human experience of design and argued for circular paths of movement because he felt it always obscured a little bit of your view and you were curious. You wanted to kind of keep going to discover what was around the corner. Uh, this building is relevant too to our discussion in that uh, although Ford was in the business of making and selling cars, there's a huge commitment here made to showing how cars move around a site. Very sort of expressive, dynamic architecture. And that's what I knew about uh, Teague. And then Jane called. And one day you'll get a call from Jane. It'll be a momentous call. And this was a momentous call. Jane said, Ira, uh, a lot of drawings just arrived here, someone found them and wants to donate them and we're trying to figure out what they are. At the time, I, I believe Jane was aware of the Teague slides, maybe she and I had already talked about them, but she thought that some conversation we had might mean I would be able to identify what these drawings were about. I came in and I was fascinated by the drawings. These were long drawings, several feet long, rolled up. Um, and I thought, Maybe, you know, maybe this is related to the Teague slides. Uh, these drawings were about a foot tall by several feet long, but my attention was really fixated on smaller stuff, which you can't see in the slides so well, uh, especially as I mentioned, because only four inches by five inches, I never projected them. Things like this, sort of a very interesting makeover rebranding of the uh, bank's logo. Attention to signage in the left, in the right, down below. A lot of fine line work. These, these lines, I kind of wondered about these angles and extra lines. What did they mean? I wasn't putting together yet what they meant. A drawing like this. Uh, again, this actually, you know where this is headed. These are the background drawings for the Teague slides. Uh, I didn't look through all of them. We don't know if it's a complete set. We'll get to that um, someday soon, I hope. But um, this extra sunscreen and these projected openings just fascinated me. Again, detail I hadn't seen in the original slides. You go back to the original slide and there it is. It's like, all right, well, the detail's there, but the addition of color, shade and shadow and signage, you know, distracts you a little bit sometimes from the underlying architecture. Uh, but you can see here, as I was mentioning before, kind of fixation on what's happening on the ground floor. 
moves or gestures that are very dynamic to kind of engage the eye in pedestrians. Uh, this block, by the way, is um, Midland, I think. Uh, we've got Fleet Feet uh, in this location today. So, oops, next slide. The more I looked, the more I thought, yeah, this, Teague's name isn't on these drawings, but these are the issues that Teague was interested in. Automobiles, we're looking at a makeover of a gas station. Uh, this is the one that I mentioned that kind of um, took over part of B Valley Road. Uh, very bold and uh, unlike a lot of the other architecture I've been showing you, um, I think sort of both sophisticated and restrained in a way. Uh, and here it is again, let's take another look at it. So look at the commitment to not just signage, but the drafting of it. We have the Richfield name. I assume that was a purveyor of gas. Uh, it's curving around the edge of this extended canopy here. It reappears here. So it'll be visible from people driving west on Bloomfield Avenue. We've got a logo, giant, giant bird logo, woodpecker maybe, I don't know. Um, but uh, we see our, our um, gas pumps here in very kind of contrasting glassy base. It's uh, some architects today call this look ma no hands architecture. But uh, in fact, this kind of design has its roots even 20 years before 1948. So whoever's made this, I'm beginning to think is maybe a learned, rather sophisticated a designer or set of designers. And another gas station, now we're um, looking south, Elm. So this is the Firestone, future Firestone area on the left. Uh, not much change actually between what was there in 1948 and what they're recommending, but the gas station has been completely made over from almost a country, uh, a country shed to something again, much more eye-catching, more at the scale of a building, position of prominence. It's because the automobile was ascendant. Uh, consumer culture was being born and cars were being recognized as something useful, important to have. Um, it gave you stature and freedom. And the underlying drawing, I love it. Uh, the drawings that are at the center now are not the pencil originals. They seem to be black line uh, reproductions, which is a little unusual for that time as opposed to um, blueprints where we'd have a blue background and white lines. I think that was done to facilitate the overlay of other tracing paper, which was then used for what I believe was gouache paint. It's similar to watercolor, but heavier to create the actual images of the Teague slides. Just, I think, wonderful, delicate draftsmanship um, and fascinating kind of decisions about form making. And you can see here these angled lines. All of that is what you do when you're particularly well trained drafts person in how to cast light and shadow. So just more clues that this was not some rookie uh, venture pie in the sky um, effort. And then this crazy almost tour de force of uh, let's do the crazy signage, let's do the sculptural element, a sunscreen, we'll put people on the roof with an umbrella. Um, this, this does show up in the slides as well. Uh, we've got the projecting I meaning this was one of the images used. I haven't mentioned, I didn't mention to Jane, a couple of the drawings I saw don't appear in the, in the slides. I'm kind of wondering if there may be additional slides, but um, this, this all made me begin to question, well, if Teague was involved, you know, what, what was he or his team after and who really made these images? And we had one great tip off, which was the roles of drawings weren't alone they came with a design for a house. And I think a couple of other, yes, a couple of other things, some site planning for um, an office park type of uh, um, development. And there was a title block and that had the name of Carl D. Schlachter. At that time, we did some quick research and couldn't figure out who Carl D. Schlachter was, but we had a name and we knew an architect was in possession of these drawings. Did Carl draw them? Was he given them? Did he inherit them? Uh, did he draw them? We just didn't know. But with the drawings having arrived and 
um, my curiosity peaked, I called Teague. And in fact, uh, Walter Dorwin Teague's business continues till the present day. Um, they are most known for their work for the aviation industry. One of their most important clients after the World War II was Boeing. And they still design lobbies, lounges, interiors for planes, exteriors, but they've kind of refocused on what we call uh, user experience. They'll still do product design, but they're very interested in human behavior. And um, I thought maybe they can help us. You know, before it didn't seem like we had enough information, but I called, explained who I was about the Montclair History Center. Do you have an archive? Can you tell anything? Tell us anything about Carl D. Schlachter? The person I spoke to was really helpful and said, I have to tell you, Ira, the archives are very poorly kept um, up through World War II uh, and even after. Uh, those records are in a place, we safeguard them, but we don't have a lot of information about what they were for. A lot of content was lost, um, but I'll look and see if there's anything connecting to Montclair. And, um, they did find something connecting to Montclair, uh, which were the slides themselves. They had their own set, but they didn't know what it was. I had to tell them what, you know, who we were and what this probably meant. Um, and I sent them our copy of the slides. Our office put each slide on a light table and took very sharp photographs, which were superior to the, pho the photography of the time, which must have produced the set of scans they sent me. Um, so uh, in addition to that, and I, I'm not really sure why. She said there was another package of information near this group of slides. And it might mean something to you. Uh, I'm going to share it with you now. Um, and it consisted of a number of images depicting, I would describe it as concerns of city dwellers in post-war America. I'm not showing you every slide. And there was no narrative. They, they had no supporting text. Uh, but I, they did tell me that it was common for Teague to travel around the country talking to communities about design. And that was the first time I'd heard about it. Second time I really heard about it and learned about it was in the book I've read from uh, by Professor Solahub. Um, I'll come back to that. But uh, we have to infer from what these slides show us what the narrative was that Teague was saying. This was the very first image. It seems to be saying cars are really important. Good circulation is important. Uh, new housing surrounded by greenery. These are important things to know about. This was the next slide. And uh, I knew what the next slide would be. So it's easy for me to set it up for you to say, by contrast, if this is the next slide I'm seeing, it's very likely the speaker was probably pointing out the contrast. Look at how many of us have lived or are living in conditions like this. Tight quarters, older homes, smoke filling the air from chimneys. We're getting past that. We're uh, building power plants. Uh, we're going to have many more cars that are going to have to be accommodated. Are we really prepared? The next group of images from Teague were like this, uh, aerials of different cities, mostly European, showing very organic, um, irregular streets. Again, I think this was probably to make the point that this is the old world. Remember all of our, um, uh, I guess we used to call them our boys who came home, uh, would have visited these places and it would have been a familiar point of reference. Today we would call this uh, charming and eclectic and uh, vintage, but at that time this was seen, I think, as the, the old world in a negative way. And then this slide, okay, it's Manhattan on the right and the Hudson, so now we're seeing Jersey. Uh, the point seemed to be, are we living so different? Are we prepared uh, for the next century? And, oh, this slide needs to be seen in its full. Um, I thought this was a really powerful and unexpected image. It's modern in that it shows kind of a, well, a misshapen clover leaf, but also maybe the downside of unregulated development. Uh, it implies to me that uh, while we had to march forward um, maybe it should be done in a rational way. Otherwise we risk uh, overcrowding, congestion, um, those sorts of things. And then this very curious image, oops, let me go back. 
very curious image of people on a beach. Um, I don't know, perhaps uh, Teague recognized people didn't want to be shoehorned into some homogeneous community and seen as just another number. Uh, so perhaps this is a nod toward recognizing and protecting our individual freedom as Americans. And then this, uh, great stuff, right? So I don't know when Blackboard Jungle, the movie came out, but um, it's easy to imagine someone looking, talking to this image and saying, now you know, uh, unless we clean up our streets, uh, unless we do better, we're gonna fall prey to all kinds of vices and bad people. Um, I can conjecture maybe that the point here was that, uh, you know, as of 1946, there were 1,313 gangs in the United States. And do you really want to live in a community that uh, uh, invites that kind of behavior? And their last image, which is very romantic, I think. It seems to be um, communicating uh, something special about the city, that the city itself is where things are happening. It's new. It's, it's a 24-7 um, kind of place where the lights are always on and things are happening and it's the future engine of the world. That was the last of the Teague slides. But it wasn't until we were able to do some further research that we could definitively say Teague was here. And so from July 1948, we have, oops, I keep choosing the wrong button. We have an article in the Montclair Times talking about Teague's presentation to the community with color slide enlargements of the renderings on view today, Mr. Teague unfolded in detail a plan for the avenue to transform it from the present hodgepodge to a superlative modern shopping district. So I have to warn you that this article and every, all the quotes in it are like, uh, thank God, I can't, we can't believe what an impediment the avenue has been and we finally have direction to make it a better place. Um, so here, Mr. Mr. Teague uh, pointed out that this new design could produce an overall harmonious effect to attract the enormous purchasing power of the area. And then again, terming Hampton House an excellent example of what a good remodeling job can be. He showed unit by unit how such simple changes as the removal of jutting cornices and unsightly display signs would of themselves greatly improve the sales appeal of the avenue. So again, remember, uh, I've shown you some images are mentioned, uh, the number of marketplaces, seemed like there was a clothing store on every block, uh, a lot of um, places that we would go to the, well, in the recent past, we might go to the mall, now we shop online, but there was a fixation on competing and keeping up with the economic growth that was already underway in the United States. And there was a, there was a real fear, I think, that uh, Montclair might fall behind, but there was also, and I won't read you all the quotes from this article, they'll be available after this presentation, um, the quotes from both local officials and residents who really dismiss the appearance of Bloomfield Avenue as it is, and are uh, very welcoming of what this new look might bring. There are references to, to the Teague uh, team, as it turns out, working on projects with building owners and their architects. So this had a measure of reality to it. Um, this same article confirmed that Carl D. Schlachter was indeed involved and he's described in a way that tells us something about the relevance of these images. I'll read you this um, in full. T gave special praise in his address to Carl D. Schlachter, architect and resident of Montclair who as a member of the Teague staff has worked on the unit by unit renderings over a period of several months. So this was a long term effort, a big, a big effort. It's not just Carl, there's a team and it's a local guy. This is not, although it is what we call a top down design exercise, uh, there is at least local input. Uh, the next paragraph, photographs of each building were made by, it's either Michael or Michelle Kelly, a Montclair photographer, to enlarge these to the scale of eighth inch to a foot, which matches the drawings at the center to correspond to the scale used in the renderings. The work would have been enormously more difficult without this excellent set of scale photographs, Mr. Schlachter said. With the photographs at hand, Schlachter and other members of the staff under Teague's supervision set out 
on the complicated detail work of producing renderings for each of the 312 shops between the Art Museum and the foot of the Lackawanna Railroad Bridge at Maple Avenue. All right, so now we know who Carl Schlachter is and we were able to do a little more research on him and find that uh, he was an educated architect and was involved in World War II, just as Teague was. Didn't see, I'm not sure they both saw action, but their um, skills as designers were deployed. Uh, Schlachter even worked on, which would have, I think, I might've started uh, a few years before, um, worked on the design of the Pentagon. So Schlachter was no lightweight. But I was thinking, um, you know, after seeing this, what, what happened to this grand effort and these big names behind it? Why wasn't more of it embraced? I think one answer might be uh, Schlachter's fate. Just two years later in 1950, he was one of the 58 passengers on a plane that went down in Lake Michigan. It, he was on his way to Seattle. He and his wife both died. And in the Herald News here, we have a description of uh, how he is the son of Mr. and Mrs. Carl H. Schlachter. So that tells us uh, he's not just a resident, he's like probably a trusted resident because uh, if Carl's doing this work and uh, Carl Sr. knows about it, they're gonna do the right thing. I'm trying to explain to you that um, although in the promotion for this presentation, it sounds a little bit like Teague's a bad, the bad guy. In many ways, the community, um, we're all in it together uh, to do this audacious transformation. Um, but check this out. Mr. and Mrs. Schlachter were on their way to Seattle where Mr. Schlachter was planning to spend 10 days to study building conditions in that area with a view to possibly moving to that city. So what we know is that in 1946, Teague got the Boeing contract just a couple years before this. They were in Seattle. Teague lived in New Jersey. I learned that from the Teague person I was able to contact. Teague lived in New Jersey, which helps explain maybe why this work was done in the first place. Um, Schlachter is described as an employee and staff member. One of the first things Teague did uh, after the war was transition from a sole ownership to partnership. I theorize that uh, Schlachter was on his way to Seattle, not just to learn about buildings, but maybe to move there as a partner and that possibly his demise and severing the connection to Montclair meant that the momentum for this vision was a little bit lost. Uh, there were other factors at play, but if he had remained with Teague and had lived, perhaps he would have been able to push harder, push locals harder, lead them through the process of a makeover. And now we come to the third part. Those are the people, the, the who and how. Uh, we come to the third part of the presentation um, where I'd like to talk about the relevance of the images. This is one of those non-frontal views. Um, it's a streetscape or really a ground level view showing uh, how some of the, the architecture I was talking about, the kind of jaunty uh, leaning forms might have felt or played out in real life. And even though I'd seen little bits of it in the town center, um, I really looked at these moments a new way. So here we are on the block that uh, faces the Dunkin' Donuts. That's a point of reference for those of you who know Montclair, a uh, storefront that has the inclined uh, windows. And it previously had made no sense to me. Uh, I understand it now as probably um, something that took place after Teague's presentation where there were selective transformations. And this is one of them. And uh, so that building was here. And then to help reorient you uh, just past that building. So just past it here. And you can see in the photograph was a liquor store until a few years ago, the liquor store was here. Um, and our firm uh, was given responsibility for making over both of those sites. The one with the inclined storefront and this rather unattractive liquor store. Our point of reference, because by this time I, I'd learned about the slides, was this image. Now, we didn't work on these two projects at the same time, so we didn't have access to this information. And even if we had, I'm not sure 
our firm would have known what to do with it to make over those inclined storefronts. But for this corner site, this was very much a point of reference for the redesign that we executed. And my firm's not alone. Other firms know about this resource now. And I believe the Historic Preservation Commission's consultant will refer to it and other images to kind of glean um, an understanding of you know, what, what was there before in the cases where people are uh, uh, altering or adding to or transforming Bloomfield Avenue. So it's become a very powerful resource for historic preservation in town. And there's that building, uh, again, the Murgatroyd, um, where Nori is today. And you can't, uh, I can't really see it here, but the, the pencil drawing for this, which I didn't include, you can see better the, uh, what seems to be an escalator inside this building um, and a mezzanine, I think, and some other interesting uh, naval inspired design choices here and an overhanging uh, roof, a cantilever we call that. And this was the work our office did. Uh, we were led by the property owner, but also by, let's say, the spirit of the times to do what we thought was a more traditional design for the location where those inclined storefronts were. Um, but it raises interesting and difficult questions, like if the uh, Teague slides had been more in circulation at the time we were first working on this project, which we did, we did this one first, the one in the foreground. Um, so we didn't, uh, we didn't just have as much awareness about the Teague slides and, and what they meant at the time, so they weren't a strong point of reference, but what does it mean now? Does it mean that uh, those inclined storefronts um, were really the right call? That's what should have been restored. Um, it's a fascinating conversation for me because arguably you want in historic preservation to protect those things that are what we call at the heart of the period of significance. Well, what was the period of significance for this site? in the foreground, was it the Teague makeover or was it the jumble of storefronts I sh showed you in the Teague slides, which predated that? Um, I have my own actually strong opinions about that, but I wanted to uh, give you a glimpse into the eye of the architect or the mind of the architect and has to ask him or herself these questions uh, when resources uh, hit the market and we're presented with them and have to make certain decisions. So this is the two buildings together and you can see obviously this is a more faithful um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll call it faithful recreation of what was there. In many ways, the bones to bring this back were in place in ways that were not for the storefront on the one story building next door. So I personally felt better about trying to pull this off. Um, and I think that it's, you know, I think, I think that it works, but um, I do look at these buildings and, and ask myself, would they turn out the same way given everything we know today? Ira, you asked for a time check. It's seven yes. fifty. Seven fifty. Oh, okay. Um, so we'll talk a little bit now, and I'll wrap it up in terms of the architectural influence of what you're looking at, because uh, Teague did, in fact, as I mentioned, work with partners and teams. He delegated work. He wasn't afraid to do that, and these were people who had direct experience and exposure to the architecture of Europe and would have encountered buildings like this, dating from the 1920s. Um, in Holland, JJP Oud, uh, there was a, a big effort in the 1920s and 30s in Northern Europe to explore abstraction, facades that were very flat or planar, but which had very sculptural elements added to them and where signage was integrated into those forms, into a band or into a projecting column. More the work of Oud, which is residential, very kind of planar and cubic, uh, same project, curvilinear forms. You can maybe imagine if you're an architecture student, perhaps you returned from the war and you're seeing this in some of the publications. And there were some serious publications uh, at that time circulating around the world that would have exposed you to these progressive projects, uh, how they could have influenced you. And this is also by Oud showing more of this sort of large scale abstract form making, including you know, things like rooftop screening, uh, the semi-mechanistic a project like this uh, in Germany, in Stuttgart uh, by Eric Mendelssohn, uh, very streamlined in appearance. It looks like, like that radio I showed you, uh, but this vocabulary really spread throughout, not just Western Europe, Eastern Europe and into Russia. And you have the work of Moshe Ginsberg 
uh, who's exploring similar themes of uh, how buildings can be simplified, abstracted, and graphics and branding can be kind of built into their form. And a housing project. Now, why am I actually even starting to talk about this? The Corbusier, back in France, a name you might have heard, uh, similarly exploring in the 1920s and 30s, uh, high level of abstraction, thinking about housing. This is a Teague slide for the eastern end of Bloomfield Avenue. There was a proposal, and this was one of the things that was most enthusiastically received, and the word enthusiasm is the word used in the account of the time, demolishing several properties to provide proper housing for over 100 families. In 1948, the conversation about um, redevelopment as a social cause was very real. It wasn't seen like we might, get, might see it now as urban renewal and a failed uh, unjust effort. There were people who believed that development in this way, tearing down the old and just starting over was the best way to um, give people a leg up and put people in circumstances that would help everyone. All of this traces back, uh, as I mentioned, to the European designers, specifically Le Corbusier, uh, some of his early studies, which were done through very powerful graphics, drawings specifically. Uh, this is housing in Pessac, which shows this attitude of like, let's make blocks in a natural setting. Uh, he eventually grew that, scaled it up, City for Three Million, where you have a very distinct um, uh, composition of buildings served by cars with huge dedicated lanes. Uh, he recommended wiping out a large part of Paris in order to realize this vision. We can laugh at that, but here in the United States, parts of New York City were wiped out to realize his vision. And this is uh, in the years immediately after World War II, you're looking at Stuyvesant Town, uh, the Corbusian vision brought to life. You can talk to people who were raised there and some of them have very fond memories. Of course, neighborhoods were wiped out to make this possible and not everyone who lived there was able to uh, relocate to the very same place. There's actually two campaigns of, of design here. I'll end with this slide just to remind us that uh, I think the people uh, who worked on the Teague slides had the best of intentions. Um, if the work had been done, this is what we'd be living with. And our own perspective of Montclair might be very different. Perhaps we'd be quite proud to have uh, a streetscape that was unique in the United States and represented a moment of high idealism at the time. Uh, of course, it wasn't to be. So uh, here we are. Um, that's, I'll wrap it up there. Thank you. And I'm happy to uh, entertain any questions um, that people might have. Uh, Rich Rockwell asks, do you think the Teak proposals influenced the design of the old Haynes building? It, it, it became clear to me as I was looking at these images that a lot of them resembled the Haynes building. Uh, this was the building where the Siena residential building is today for people who are newer to Montclair. Um, I, I don't know, I wish I did, I should. Um, that's an incredible building because it, it does have a lot of these characteristics, characteristics of an exterior that's kind of blank and brooding with projecting openings. Uh, it's on the interior where you get a lot of the sort of uh, swooping streamlined form making and space making. Um, there's a great group of images at the Library of Congress that shows that project uh, in its glory. Um, but the answer is I should know and I don't, I'm sure that the one influenced the other. Either the Haynes was already here and it, it was something the designers were eyeballing or uh, perhaps having seen this group of images, the people who designed Haynes were thinking, hey, they've done most of our work for us. Let's, let's borrow some of this imagery. Yeah, I wasn't sure about the date and if there was any overlap of any of the designers. It. It's, it's like a lot of things in my presentation. Um, that's a, a thread to pull and I'm sure there's going to be interesting things to learn, which whatever whatever you find on the dating. Yeah. Um, another question from Jory. Did Tiger Schlachter work on the Hampton House? Do you know? Also the now gone McDonough Tire Building. We don't know. I don't know who designed the Hampton House. Um, Teague talks about it, but doesn't know uh, or take credit for its design. So I'm thinking Teague probably didn't design it. Uh, the Hampton House makeover though, in 1947, I remember meeting the son of the owner 
and the owner was the man who made, did the makeover. He was very proud to show me uh, a full page Montclair Times ad announcing the makeover of the building. I got to believe um, within the records, there's some description of who was involved in that project. Um, but like the Haynes, that team is anonymous for, for now, for today. And then the McDonough Tire building, I don't know if I know that building, which, which it may predate my time. I got here in 1997, where, where's the McDonough? Uh, it, was, it, it was next to Social Security, right? By oh. where the art, where the art oh, yes. district is now. Yeah. Yes, of course, okay. And that's a site I should know because I was, I was involved in, in helping that project a little bit. Um, yes, McDonough, uh, boy. I, I don't know, uh, a look at the Teague slides for that block would tell us a lot. And interestingly, by, by the way, the social security building was one of those older buildings left untouched, again, maybe because it was a federal structure, um, but I, I haven't taken note of whether the McDonough is already the McDonough in 1948. Um, lots of questions, not lots, two questions go right to the heart of the matter that we actually were speaking about earlier today is who paid for the design work and who would have paid for the implementation? Right. This is another thread. Um, and these are, these are, these are consequential questions in the, um, reporting of the time. It's very clear that town officials are involved in the project. It's not clear whether the town actually helped underwrite the work. The banks are mentioned by Teague and by the reporters as somehow being involved. I don't know if that means um, that the town fathers, as it were, got together. Uh, this is the era of the smoke-filled room um, or the back, the back, the back room, some, some room, you know, you all know what I'm talking about. Let's all contribute a thousand dollars and we're gonna give it to Mr. Teague and we're gonna to give it to our local guy Schlachter. And this is what we have to do to save the community. It's easy to imagine that honestly, but there's so far no evidence of it. I'm confident that more can be learned by looking closer both in the newspapers, but also at the planning board records. Um, it's mentioned as I, as I showed you that there's still stuff to take away from that very first image I showed you, that piece of pad, that pad piece of paper from the pad it, it's 1965 planning board meeting. I, I haven't gone and found the minutes from that meeting. I hope they exist. I believe they do. They probably cite, uh, you know, the foundation of the work, like a mere 19 years ago or whatever, 17 years earlier, we commissioned this report and let's review its relevance. And let's not forget the town paid for it. You know, there's going to be something learned from further research on this, on that issue. And it's, it's an important question because as I mentioned, top-down design was de rigueur at the time. Uh, but regardless, you have people from the community, merchants who are quoted, residents who are quoted, almost like in relief, talking about, with embarrassment about Bloomfield Avenue and relief that something's finally being done. So we're gonna look back and then we're gonna look forward with the next couple of questions. All right, so the one that looks backward is, why do you think the bank buildings were left intact? Were they trying to preserve a classical ideal? And then we start talking after that about uh, comprehensive plannings for the future of Bloomfield Avenue. Um, and someone mentioned the Mondrian inspired painting design for the back of the building on Lorraine Avenue and wondered if we think that Montclair is ready for modernism in some form yet again. So take those in whatever order you wanna take them in. Uh, let's talk about the banks first. Um, I think that a, uh, a worldly designer in 1948 may have recognized there was nothing wrong with those classical buildings and deserved to be left as they were. I don't think the concept of preservation was a very strong one, so I doubt they would have thought of the buildings in terms of we got to preserve this for future generations. Um, on the other hand, if I'm right about the banks being involved in helping make this happen, I could see in a self-serving way, the banks saying, well, there is a condition, Mr. Teague, we're not going to spend money on what were rather expensive buildings. A lot of them were built in the late teens and twenties. Uh, so it's you know a mere 20 to 30 years before, 20, 25 years before, the banks may have just put their foot down and said, well, 
will participate, but not by changing our look. Those are my two explanations for why the, the buildings remain the way they were. And then um, is, is Montclair ready for modernism? Uh, well, we're going to find out. Uh, a couple of projects that were approved are under construction and are, you can describe them at the very least as modern leaning on North Willow. You have uh, a project that's um, going up now, North Willow and Glen Ridge. And it's granted it's gonna be faced in brick, but it's got a lot of very large glazed openings. And those are actually operable garage doors. And that's a residential uh, building. And then uh, an even more kind of classically modern design, you have halfway back toward Bloomfield Avenue uh, opposite uh, Pete's. Uh, again, if you're not a local, I'm sorry, but if you're local, you know exactly what I mean. Uh, it's a very kind of narrow, tall, more modern building, also residential, more of what we'll call maybe purist or white modern building. I think the reaction to those will be interesting. Uh, the Mondrian, it's funny because, you know, what. <sighs> We're in 2021 and Mondrian was doing that work almost a hundred years ago. <laughs> and, and I think there is a kind of concern or reservation about being modern, but yet to do Mondrian today is really a historic reference. Um, but of course it's the look, it's the, the loss of the jutting cornices as Teague put it. Um, and that building has already lost its cornices. So I, I think we'll learn a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm a supporter of the Mondrian project. I think, hey, you know, the proportions and stuff could be a little bit better on the design, but it sounds like the architect's working on that. Uh, so I, I'll be having my ear to the ground to see just uh, what people think of those, those buildings. And also, is there a compromise? This will be the last question because we're actually running over. Is there a comprehensive plan for Bloomfield Avenue? No. Today? Yeah. Today, is there a there is no comprehensive plan in terms of architectural design. I think there has been a plan to do a better job of organizing and placing our parking. So it's, so there will be less congestion. The parking will be less in our faces, um, which I think is good for creating a, a walkable community. So I'm gonna wrap it up with Tony's comment to you, Ira, which is terrific research and fabulous presentation. You're a born teacher. So thank you very much. We really appreciate well, it today. Kind words, thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure.